my class. We talked about the two verbs in the Bible. Leviticus, the 14th chapter. Someone turn there for me. Leviticus chapter 14. And we, it talks about two birds being offered. How many of you ever heard anybody preach on the two birds? Lessons on the two birds. I've mentioned them several times, but I never really got into very much detail on this. And it's a very beautiful, beautiful lesson. And it is a type. Okay? It's a type. Who's got uh, Leviticus 14, 1 through 7? Leviticus 14, 1 through 7. Who found that? Uh, Rajo, are you there? Yes, sir. All right. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leper in the day of cleansing. Now he shall be brought out to the priest, and the priest shall go out to the outside of the camp. Thus the priest shall look, and if the infection of the leprosy has been healed in the leper, then the priest shall give orders to take two live clean birds and cedar wood and a scarlet string and hyssop for one who is to be cleansed. The priest shall also give orders to slay the one bird in the earth earthenware vessel over the running water. As for the live bird, he shall take it together with the cedar wood and the sponge string and a hyssop and shall dip them all shall dip them and the live bird in the blood of the bird was slain over the running water. He shall then sprinkle seven times the one who is to be cleansed from from the hyssop, from the leprosy, and shall pronounce him clean, and shall let the live bird go free over the open field. All right, this is a double type that we have here. A double type. Remember our word type? Types. Our word types comes right straight from the Greek word typos. All right? And by the way, uh, let me share this with you just a little bit. I, I shared it with the other class. But uh, how many of you have heard of George Washington? <laughs> huh? George Washington? He was the first president of the United States. Uh, George Washington did not have a formal education. He had a large library, and he was an educated man in his day. And he was probably one of the greatest men in American history. He was a great general. He did not sign the, the, the Declaration of Independence, so if you go back, you won't see his name on there. And in his day, he felt... Uh, totally inadequate to be the president of the United States. They wanted to make him king, and he wouldn't take it. They wanted him to keep on being president. But he was uneducated. He was considered himself uneducated because he did not know Greek and Latin. Oh, uh, if you were educated, you studied the classics in Greek and in Latin in the languages they were written in. And he was so he felt so incompetent in speaking to the people of America because there were a lot of men: Samuel Adams, John Quincy, or uh, John Adams, uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson. These people that surrounded him were educated men, and they 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 spoke and wrote fluently in Greek and Latin. And you were not considered educated unless you were educated in Greek and Latin. So see, I'm trying to educate you people. He would not even write his own speeches. He had someone else write his speeches because he was afraid that he, he just could not get it down on paper correctly. How many of you knew that? Well, we're exposing you to a little Greek and a little bit of Hebrew in this class, so I'm educating you. All right. Give you a little bit of early American history that way. Types. And tipos. What does it mean? What does it mean first? Remember what it means? It means to, to strike. And our word typewriter, how did the old typewriters work? How many of you have ever seen an old typewriter? <laughs> Some of you have it. I've got what I use all the time almost every day. But it strikes. It has a little hammer and it hits with a with the imprint of whatever number, letter, or whatever you, you're going to put on there, and it hits a ribbon and puts it on a piece of paper. All right? So that's, that's what we call a typewriter. Now, in the Old Testament days, there were different events. <coughs> there were people. There were uh, offerings and sacrifices that were a type of Christ to come and also a type 
of us. Now let's look at this double type we have here with the leper and with the birds. The leper. Now, leprosy is, is a dreaded disease. Back in the Bible days, once that you had contracted leprosy, you could never come into a city again. You had to live in a leper colony. You were When people came near you, you had to holler what? Unclean. Unclean. unclean because I'm unclean. They, this was, you were absolutely isolated. You were quarantined away from everybody else. Okay? Now, a leper was completely helpless in getting any help at all. Did you know that? There's only one thing that could cleanse a leper, and they knew it back in those days. It was the grace of God. God had to heal them. And if one of them was healed, that's why we have the, in Leviticus, the 14th chapter here, why we have this story. And we have a, uh, a, a program they had to go through if you thought, if you were a leper and you had leprosy, these are the things you had to do because only God could heal you. No medicine. You couldn't get a doctor to come to see you. As a matter of fact, the preacher, you couldn't go to church. You couldn't go around anybody else. You were totally helpless. What do you think that represents, this leprosy? This leper? Sin. Huh? Sin. The sinner. We are helpless in sin. We are totally helpless. We are born in sin in this world because of our father Adam. We all have the sentence of death in us. Once a person uh, contracted leprosy, uh, some people would only live five years, some people would live ten years, and some people would live twenty years with leprosy. It was sometimes it was fast moving, and it's all kind of like cancer. Many times they think it was cancer that they had. Well, there was a fast moving type, and the medium moving, and the slow moving type, and some people were isolated for twenty years. But if anyone was ever healed lepr of leprosy through their prayers. Out in this isolated thing, how many of you? Uh, uh, what was that movie that Cecil B. DeMille made with uh, that great uh, Ben Hur? Ben Hur. Ben Hur. And this guy had uh, a sister and a mother that had leprosy, and they were in this leper colony. And people would bring them food and let it down on the basket, and there they'd come out and get this food. And they lived like a bunch of wild dogs in these caves. That's what that's what sin does to us, really, in life. We're helpless. There's only one way, only one hope that we have, and that's in Jesus Christ. Totally helpless. The preacher had to go to them. They couldn't go to the preacher. They had to send somebody, Some they had to depend upon somebody to even come by. Maybe one of their family and say, hey, I'm healed. But even though you were healed and you were once pronounced a leper, you couldn't go back into society at all. Somebody had to send for a preacher, a priest. And the priest came out and he inspected you. And if you did not show signs of leprosy anymore, then guess what? It was the gift of God. So they had to bring an offering. Now guess what the offering was? Two birds. Two turtle doves, actually. If you come out to my house today, you'll see some birds. Some doves in a cage out there in my backyard. That's the kind of animals that these the, the, this offering was because they were cheap. There were a lot of them and it didn't cost very much. Guess how much money lepers had? Pretty much zilch. So that was the smallest offering. By the way, the poor people, instead of having to buy a lamb or something, if they were too poor, they could buy a dove. Actually, they brought two doves. Two doves. What do you think those two doves represented that were a type of? Huh? They were a type of Christ, but they were a type of his death and his resurrection. That's what they're a type of. Those doves were a type of the death and resurrection of Christ. Now let's look and see. Now these doves <coughs> were a type of Christ. Now the one dove. Here we have two healthy doves, okay? And they bring the two healthy doves to the priest. And the priest decides which one of them is going to die and which one of them is going to live right off. You know that? And he calls for running water. Now, living water is what it says in Hebrew, living water. What is living water? Hmm? It's a stream. 
It is a creek or a stream. That's running water, living water. You know that water can go over uh, so many rocks for a certain period of time and it'll totally uh, cleanse itself. And that's what you call living water. Water that won't harm you if you drink it. Water out of a bucket or a barrel or a cistern or something was dead water. And he said, bring living water to me. Now let's go back into the wilderness where Egypt, where, I mean, where Israel left Egypt and they went into the wilderness. By the way, the word wilderness there, you know what that means? That means absolute desolate. There was nothing out there in that wilderness that would support life, by the way. And God called them out there into the wilderness, and how long did they live out there in the wilderness? Forty years. Forty years. Guess what? They lived off of all the time they, they were out there in the wilderness. By the grace of God, God fed them. What, what were the two things that He fed them? Manna. Manna. Manna and quail. Another time. Manna and quail. And what does manna mean? What is it? Because they didn't know what it was. All right? And they still don't know what it was. That's why they still call it, what is it? Okay? They didn't know what it was, but God rained it down and provided it every day. And there was something else that God provided out there in, in, in this wilderness, this total desert. How much water is there in the desert? None. And God not only provided water, but He provided living water. I want you to pay attention to this living water. And how did God get the living water to him? What did Moses do? Moses took Aaron's rod. By the way, how many of you saw the Ten Commandments? There's a great correction that you have to make to the Ten Commandments. Moses never stood before Pharaoh at all. Did you know that? Moses never performed one of his miracles. Who did it? Aaron. Who told him what to do? Moses told him what to do, and Aaron did it. All right, they kind of got that messed up. All right, I mean a lot of. I saw it on screen. I know it. <laughs> I saw him. <laughs> but Aaron did it, not Moses. Well, Moses took Aaron's rod out in the wilderness, and he struck a rock. And what's usually in a rock? More rock. More rock. <laughs> <laughs> okay, more rock. Well, in this rock, God struck this rock, and out came what? Water. Living water. Living water. And Jesus said several times during his ministry, Come unto me, and I'll give you living water. He said, I am the rock in the wilderness. Not only that, but he said, I am the manna that came down out of heaven. All right? Now, where the birds spend a lot of their time Trees. In, in the air. <laughs> All right, they fly. That's why they have wings, you know. <laughs> Some birds spend a lot of time in the air. They'll fly from, from North America to Antarctica. You know, crows can, you know, they're a weird looking little old creature. And if you come up to my house, you'll see crows too. <laughs> But they fly all over, and there's so many crows even in Antarctica and up in Alaska and, and near the North Pole. Those rascals get around all over. And how do they get there? On the train? <laughs> they fly. All right, they fly. Trans World Airlines. Yeah. They fly with their little wings. Well, birds spend a lot of time in the air. So, where did Christ come from? Heaven. He got. He is God that came down out of heaven to earth. That's what this bird typifies. All right, and they took a earthen vessel, a clay pot. All right, a clay pot. What is a pot made out of? Earth. Clay, part of the earth. All right. And God, in John 1 and 1 and John 1 14, and I, you've heard this a thousand times, but it, John 1 and 1 says, In the beginning kept on being the Word. And the Word there should be translated Jehovah because that's who it's talking about. That's not the Greek idea of Logos, but it's the Hebrew idea of the unspeakable name of God. And they called him the Word. So it says, In the beginning kept on being the Word, and, it kept, and the Word kept on being an inseparable part of the Godhead. That's what it says there in, in, in the middle of that verse. And then the last, and it says, The Word, the Jehovah, kept on being God. Even though God came down out of heaven to earth, he still was God. God had to redeem man from his sin because he was helpless like the leper. 
The leper could not go to church. The leper could not go and seek God, but God had to seek the leper. Okay? And God had to heal the leper. So we have this one bird, and they take this living water, running water, and put it in this vessel. Okay? And here's where two streams of water, or two streams meet. The stream of blood from the bird, and the stream of running water from the creeks. They would pull the little bird's head off and drain his blood into this pot, this clay pot which represented a bird. This bird died. Didn't it? They took the bird and they drained his blood into the pot. And then they took, took it outside they, and they killed it outside of the camp. Again, where was Jesus crucified? Not in Jerusalem, but outside of Jerusalem, wasn't he? Outside of Jerusalem. Jesus said that he came unto his own, but his own received him not. His own creation received him not. But the things did. The creation received Christ, the, the birds, the animals of the earth. When Jesus was out in the wilderness, he, he was out in the wilderness, he was tempted, wasn't he? He was out in the wilderness. Now, who came to Jesus in the wilderness for that 40 days? The wild animals. <laughs> That's right. You go look it up. He was out there with the wild animals. Now he wasn't afraid of the wild animals because the wild animals knew who he was. All right. That wild donkey that was taken for him to ride in Jerusalem that had never been, I don't know whether he was a bronco or what it was. But that donkey had never been ridden. Maybe somebody couldn't ride him. Maybe he was so wild that no one could ride him. But he was standing by his mother and he had never been ridden, but Jesus rode him, didn't he? He had no trouble with him. When God called all the crickets and, and the grasshoppers and, and things into Egypt, they didn't say, we're not going. They went. All right, they went. Now, God said in Leviticus, the 14th chapter, how that this offering was to be made. We have a helpless leper. And you take two doves, and you kill one of them and put its blood in this pot and it has to be running water. Okay? And then the other one is this hell there for the time being. It's hell there for the time being. It's still alive, healthy, and everything else. So you take this and it's outside the camp. And then what did you do? What happened to the bird? What did you do with the bird? The live bird? Let it go. What? Let it free. What did they do to it first before they set it free? Oh, they dipped it in the water. They dipped it in the water and the blood. Just think about that. They baptized it in the water <coughs> and in the blood. That's what they did. And then they took it out in the field and they turned it loose. All right? They turned that bird loose. And where did the bird go? Up into the sky. Up into, like, it was a type of Christ. It was a type of... When Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, they took his body and laid it in a grave for three days. All right? The, the Jonah, we talk about the type of Jonah. Jonah was a type of Christ also. Why was Jonah a type of Christ? We have to look at all these types. Jesus used it several times when he talked about Jonah. He said, I'll give you nothing but the sign of the prophet Jonah. As he, uh, three, ni three days and three nights, dead. Jonah was not alive in that, in that fish's belly. He was dead. It said he cried unto God from Sheol. Sheol is not the whale's belly or the fish's belly. Where is Sheol? That's the place of the parted spirits. That's what we call Abraham's bosom. He cried from Abraham's bosom from the place of the parted spirits unto God and said, I'll go back and do it. <laughs> that was a rebellious... Uh, Yes, Rosalind. So all that, that people, they, they go there to Shiloh? And before Christ, before oh, the cross of Calvary, everybody that died went to paradise or Sheol. Okay? It's also called hell. Now, let me show you a little picture of this. This is before Christ. Okay. Here was Sheol. All right? All right? Something like this in Hebrew. Like 
like that. But <clears throat> Sheol means the place I ask about. They want to know whether aunts and uncles or whatever died, where they went. They want to Sheol. Well, on one side of Sheol was paradise. The word paradise, it uh, comes from the the Greek word paradise, which comes from the Hebrew word, the Hebrew word paradise, which comes from the Chaldean word or the Persian word paradise. All right, it came through all of those languages, and it means a guarded pleasure garden, like the Garden of Eden. All right, it's like a garden. A guarded pleasure garden. Well, on the other side of this was hell and hell fire. Okay? Luke chapter 16. Yeah, Luke the chapter 16. It'll tell you all about this place right here. Luke 16. All right, you want to read about that? That's where you go. Well, when everyone died before Christ rose from the dead, they went to this paradise, this guarded pleasure park. Okay? And they were there until Christ resurrected them from. Well, on the other side over here were the, the lost people that did not know Christ, that chose not to know God. They were incarcerated here in many, many ways of suffering. Let's go back now. Here we have these two birds, these two doves. One of them has been taken outside the camp. It was killed. Its blood was put in the basin with running water or living water. Christ said he was a living water, didn't he? Mm -hmm. So you, you see the types. The other one was dipped. Now this other dove was dipped into there. And the other dove was turned loose and he flew out up into the heavens. Now we have type, the, a type of Christ in his death. One bird died, didn't he? One bird died. Did Christ die for all men's sins? First John 2 and 2, Brother Arthur. How does that coincide with the scapegoat? Well, that's a, a lot like the scapegoat, Brother. That, it really is. It's, it's a lot like the scapegoat. The scapegoat, you had one goat that was, uh, uh, that was killed, slaughtered. And then the other goat was taken out into the wilderness and turned loose. And they confessed every man's sins on it. And the scapegoat that died was a type of what? Of Christ's death. What was the other the, the other scapegoat that was turned loose? That's the hype of his resurrection. All right. Now we have the one dove here. The one dove that died was a type of Christ's death. God came down to, to, to earth, the clay vessel. Remember the clay vessel. The clay vessel typified for the earth. That this, the blood was caught in this clay earthen vessel. This meant something. When... You know, when the Bible says something, almost every word in the, in, in the Word of God is very important. But sometimes even what is not there is very important. When it leaves something blank, like we, we studied in Melchizedek, it didn't tell anything about his mother or father, so that was the left out, because that was a type of Christ again, when God became flesh. All right, John 1.14, someone read John 1.14 for me. We're talking about this earthen vessel and the dove that was killed and his blood was put in the, the earthen vessel. All right, John 1, 14. Kaiho logo starts again at All right, that's what it says in green. Brother Randy, you got that? And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. <coughs> All right. And the Word became flesh. And how should the word word be translated? Jehovah. Jehovah. All right. Very good. Jehovah and Jehovah. And what does the name Jehovah mean? What does its name mean? The name Jehovah. It comes from the, the Hebrew Hakya. All right. It means the one who shall become. Do you see how plain this is now? The one who shall become. Now let's read it again. And the one who shall become became <laughs> and dwelt among us. How much plainer could that be? All right. How much plainer could be? The one who shall become became. Kai Pologos Sarks. 
and the word, the logos, the Jehovah, and then it says sarks. What does sarks mean? Flesh. Flesh. And then it says again a toe. He became. Third person singular. First heirs, indicative middle. That's beautiful. Linguistically, all right? Third person single, singular, he. He became. All right? He became. And it's Aris tense. How many of you remember what Aris tense means? Brother Greg, you remember what that means? Hope till your action. It happened in the point of time when God became flesh. Middle voice. I mean, the Bible is inspired grammatically. <laughs> Down to the last crossing of the T and dotting of every I. He became for himself. God, it says, led himself out of eternity and into space and time in the person of Jesus Christ. John 1, 14. And the word, the Jehovah, flesh, he became and he dwelt among us. Now, we see we have this earthen vessel. Leviticus, the 14th chapter. Clay, earth, and it stands for what? The earth. God came to earth. God tasted death. The one bird was killed. His blood was drained in there with living water. Remember the kind of water that Moses fed Israel with in the wilderness when there was no water there to be had. And that live bird was dipped into that blood and water and turned loose. And it was a type of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Isn't that a beautiful, beautiful type? Isn't that a beautiful story? And what did that live bird do? What was on that live bird? Sins. Huh? Sins. Sin. Because what? Was what was he covered in? Blood. <coughs> Blood. And who, what? Why did that bird die? Because of somebody's sin. Because of somebody's sin. What did Jesus do when he died on the cross of Calvary? He, he, first of all, he died. And his spirit went into paradise. And he went down there and it says in, in, in Peter that he preached unto these people that were down here. I think he said, I have overcome. What was the last verse? words that Jesus spoke on the cross of Calvary. It wasn't Aloha, Aloha, and Allah Sabbath, and what was it? Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. Oh, Father, forgive them, for they not what, know what to do. And then he said, Aloha, Aloha, and Allah Sabbath, and he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Psalm 22 and verse 1, he quoted in Hebrew. And then what was the last thing he said? It is finished. It is finished. It is, finished. It is, it is done. It's finished. And then he deposited his spirit with the Father. Well, his spirit went down in here. His soul went down into paradise. Because God had become like man. God had a body <coughs> like man. He was related to man so he could be our kinsman redeemer. Another type in the Old Testament. If you wanted to redeem anybody, if you wanted to buy him out of, of, of debt or whatever, you had to be, first of all, related to them. That's what the whole book of Ruth in the Old Testament is written about. It's, it shows the story of the kinsman redeemer. All right, The story of the kinsman redeemer. Now when that bird took off, <coughs> he took off with your sins. Did you know that? Here we have the bird. One bird died, the live bird was dipped in the blood and the water, and he was turned loose. And he was turned loose to never come back again. To never come back again. And to bear your sins one way. When Christ died, he went in here and then he rose and he came back into his body again. What did he, what did he say to Mary one time? Stop clinging to me. I'm going to sin to my body. I'm going to send to my Father. What do you think He wanted up that went up in the heavens for? To take that blood and make that offering in heaven for you to bear your sins. That make you smile. As that bird was turned loose after he'd been dipped in that dead blood, that talk about the resurrection. Not only talk about. 
Christ's resurrection, but it talked about your resurrection. You see, you know that? That little bird in the Old Testament, the one died and the one dipped in that blood and then the one was turned loose, that sealed the resurrection for you. Once you've been touched by the blood of Jesus Christ, you're going to be resurrected in a glorified body. Sins have been carried away and sent away. Isn't that beautiful? I ought to say amen, some of them. <laughs> At least the same ones. <laughs> All right. Amen. That's beautiful. Isn't, it? isn't that a beautiful truth? It's a story. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. That's what that typical body is. We have baptism there, don't we? We have the clay vessel, and we have the water, and we have the blood. When you're baptized up here, what what is when I baptized you here a while back? What what do we say about that? Buried with Christ in His death, and raised new uh, because of His resurrection, and unto newness of life. And that's not all. You're going to come out of the grave. That's a picture of the resurrection. When that bird was dipped into that water and in that blood. And he came out of that water and was turned loose and he flew away. That's a type of your resurrection, not only Christ. These beautiful types, aren't they, in the, in the Old Testament? <coughs> okay, how about the red heifer offering? Genesis, the 28th chapter. In Genesis, the 28th chapter, it talks about a red heifer. And what in the world's a heifer? Cow? Huh? Cow? Female cow. That's a female cow that hasn't had a baby. That's what a heifer is. All right? It's a young cow that has not had a baby. And she had to be red. What do you think the red typified? Huh? Blood. All right. Now, in Hebrews 9th chapter, verses 13 and 14, every Old Testament sacrifice is typical of something. It's a typical of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And in Numbers 19 and verse 21, Genesis, or uh, Numbers 19... And in the book of Genesis, and in Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verses 13 and 14, Hebrews, uh, ninth, or Numbers 19 and verse 21, these are all part of this talking about the red heifer. We're not going to go there, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about this red heifer. This red heifer, this young cow that not had, had not had a baby, they would take this heifer and they would confess their sins upon it again. All right? The whole nation of Israel, by the way. And they would take, and almost every other sacrifice, when they killed the sacrifice, they would take and eat part of it. But this one was supposed to be eaten. This one was burned to ashes. Totally to ashes. How many of you know when, uh, when soap was invented? Well, it wasn't too long ago. A lot of people run around dirty a long time. <laughs> well, what is soap made out of that we use today, basically? What's it made out of? Lye. Animal fat. Uh, well, they use animal fat in it. But what makes the detergent quality of soap? Well, ashes. 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 Is like Papa? This is way before... If, you know, if people would have just read the Word of God, they'd figured out how to make soap. But because this was a cleanser, they would take the, soap, the, the ashes of the red heifer and they would mix it with running water. Again, living water. They would mix this, and guess what they had? A detergent quality. Something that would cleanse. Something that was antibacterial. All right? This was an antibacterial soap, so-called. And whatever they wanted to cleanse, it would actually cleanse it. And before they could ever put the tabernacle or the temple in service at all, guess what they had to have? Ashes of the, the ashes of the red heifer. Now, let me tell you a little bit of extra biblical <coughs> revelation here. In the book of Maccabees and the Apocrypha, in the second chapter of the book of Maccabees, it talks about this. It says there that 
that when Israel was about to be overcome by Nebuchadnezzar, when he was about to come and tear, carry all the temple things, tear the temple down and carry everything out of there away, it said that God warned Jeremiah to take the tabernacle. And guess what was put in there along with that tabernacle? He said, take the tabernacle, take the Ark of the Covenant. You don't want to know where the lost Ark is? It's not lost. God had it hid way back then by Jeremiah. He took it in the mountain that overlooks Israel, and it's in the book, it's in the in the nation of Jordan today, and in a cave in that mountain, the same mountain that God buried Moses in when he died. And he put him in a cave. But he had Jeremiah put this Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle and all the furniture and everything and the, everything in there, and he had to take with him what? Also, the ashes, the container that held the ashes of the red heifer. Because the, the service of God can never be started again unless they have the ashes of the red heifer. And they kept saying over and over again, you hear in the news now and then, they found a perfect red heifer. I'm going to tell you something. You can go out and you can find red heifers all over the place. But this was a special one. That they keep, and they kept the ashes of that red heifer for hundreds and hundreds of years, using that those ashes of that red heifer to cleanse everything for all the services of it. All right. Now that red heifer typified what? <coughs> Christ, because it could not have a spot or a blemish on it, could it? The red heifer could not have a spot or a blemish on it. Did Christ have any sin in him? No. We talk about Adam in the Old Testament. Adam was a type of the second Adam. The first Adam, our father, every one of us, I'm American Indian. We have black people in here. We have white people in here. We have brown people. We have yellow people. We have all kinds of people in here. But you know where we came from? Adam. That's it. Adam is our father. We're all related. You go back far enough and you're all related to Adam. Now, when Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, guess what he gave you? He gave you a gift. A gift that you don't want. Death. The first Adam gave us death. He gets awfully cold in this room, doesn't he? Yeah. <laughs> I think they turned the air conditioner on us all. I don't think we've got a any control over this at all. Just bundle up. <laughs> the first Adam gave us death. And it said that the first Adam was a death dealer. He was the one that sentenced all of us to death. It said the second Adam is the God, the Spirit that came down out of heaven to earth to get everybody life. The life-giving Adam. The first one was a death-dealing Adam, and the second one was a life-giving Adam. Give you life. Your heart beats today because the first Adam gave you, first of all, life, but he gave you that life with a sentence of death. In it. But as once you're born into this world, you start dying, don't you? You start dying. See all these times we're given. The Bible teaches us that we're all born into this world, but we're born into sin. Born into sin. Sin. Now, last Sunday I said, and I saw Rogers use the same illustration last Sunday that I did, but when a little baby is born into this world, all it knows how to do is cry to get your attention. And it'll cry when it's lying. <laughs> It might want your attention when it doesn't really... All he wants is your attention. You know. Pay me some attention now. I don't, I'm not, I don't have a dirty diaper. I'm not hungry. But I want you to hold me. That's all. And in all reality, he's learning how to lie because he's telling you something's wrong. I used another illustration one time. I had a smart little dog one time named Poncho. That dog would pull tricks on me. He lied to me sometimes. And in my house that I lived over east of Bakersfield, I had a... You, here was a, a house like this. 
the kitchen was over here like this in the hallway when you came into it and the big living room and then here was the library and I'd be sitting here at my desk behind my chair looking and reading and studying everything else and the dog would usually been running around here someplace and Pachi would run around and he'd jump up and get me on the leg with his front feet just like that getting my attention like that and they'd take off to the door the door was right here He'd run from in here, run toward the door, telling me he had to go outside. Well, he knew if I, I didn't, I didn't want him to have an accident in the house, so I'd go open the door for him to go outside, no matter what I was doing. So I'd get up in here. He'd come and get my attention. I'd walk through here like this, except right here was a was a entrance way into the kitchen. And right over here on the kitchen cabinets, right there, was doggy snacks. <laughs> <laughs> and if I wasn't paying any attention to him or anything else, he'd come up here and act told me he wanted to go outside, except when we got right here, he'd dive into the kitchen. I don't have to go outside at all. <laughs> he'd go and look up there on that cabinet. Well, I'd give him a treat and I'd make him go outside too. <laughs> he wasn't going to do that to me and get by with it. <laughs> anyway, then I was finished with him for a while until he come banging on the door. Well, babies lie to us sometimes because they, they want attention when they don't really need it. Now, In John 1, 45 through 51, let's go there real quick. John 1, 45 through 51. John, the first chapter, verses 45 through 51. Someone read that for me. John 1, 45 through 51. Who's got that? Randy, you have that? Bill found Nathaniel and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathaniel said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathaniel answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are King of Israel. <laughs> Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. All right. What in the world is he talking about? <coughs> How many of you ever heard of Jacob's ladder? Huh? Yeah. All right. This is Jacob's ladder, what he's talking about. How many of you ever correlated that to? This, this thing they talk about. The thing. Jacob was dreaming one night, wasn't he? Had his head on a stone. And some people say that stone that he had his head on is, is underneath the throne there in England. I don't know whether that's true or not. But this stone that he had his head on, he was dreaming and he was praying to God. How many of you ever pray when you're asleep? Sometimes you pray when you're awake. Sometimes you pray when you're asleep, don't you? All right. That's what Jacob was doing. He was praying to God. Now, what do you think Nathaniel was doing out there? Praying. This is a type of Jacob's ladder again. He was praying. He was out there underneath this, this tree praying to God. And he, he saw the stairway to heaven. That's what it was. The Jacob's ladder is a stairway to heaven. That's what it is. And we have Nathaniel, and we have Jacob's ladder. Now, what had happened with Jacob? Why was he out there? 
Why was he praying so hard? What was wrong with Jacob? Genesis, the 28th chapter, is where that's found. What in the world happened to Jacob? Well, he was in trouble, wasn't he? He was in trouble. He had, he had cheated his brother Esau out of his birthright. Because Esau was the firstborn. <coughs> but God didn't choose Esau, did he? Who did he choose? Jacob. Jacob is called, what, what is Jacob? What's the modern name for Jacob? What is the name in any English for Jacob? Jake. Huh? Jake. Jake. Jim. Jim. No, Jake. James. 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 That's it. All right. Jacob's James. All right. That's what it was. Yay. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> we know what that is, don't we? I mean. <laughs> James. All right. So Jacob's out there. What does the name James mean or Jacob? Trickster. All right. All right. Jacob had tricked his brother out of his inheritance. We. How many of you know that story? How many? How many of you know the story of how he just tricked him? You know, he went in there and, and and his wife found out. His mother found out that he was going to put the blessing upon Esau that day, in in spite of what God told him to do. God told him to bless Jacob, and he wasn't going to do it. He was going to bless Esau anyway. So God overruled it through his wife and through Jacob. And he said, go out there and, and get... And he told Esau, go out and get me a, a, a deer. And bring this deer in and I'll eat it, cook it up for me like I... And after I eat, I'll put the blessing upon you. And Esau was hairy and smelled like the goat. <laughs> like a billy goat. And Jacob was not. He was not like that. So the mother says, let's go out there and kill a goat. A goat and a deer smell a whole lot alike. They're strong meat. Well, he killed the goat, and he took the skin of the goat and put on his arms. Well, his dad was about <coughs> just about blind and couldn't hear very well. Couldn't hear very well to even distinguish the voices of his two sons. He could just barely hear. Well, he said, I'm going to make... His mother says, I'm going to make it the kind of food just like he likes. We'll take that goat and you go in there and you act like you're Esau. And he did. He, he pretended. He acted like Esau. And he said, and he come over and let me feel of you. So he felt of his hairy arms. Except it was a goat skin. Oh, that's Esau, all right. He smells just like him. <laughs> that's my boy. <laughs> so he put all the blessings upon Esau. And then he left. And then here comes the stinker. <laughs> the real stinker comes in. And then his dad starts bawling and wailing. He says, man, I've given all the blessing to your brother. He tricked me. He tricked you out of the death. I'm going to kill him. <laughs> the boy, all the rest of Esau's life, he wanted to kill Jacob. Because he tricked him out of his inheritance. But in all reality, Esau despised his inheritance, God said. Because he wasn't thinking about that. All he thought about was the now. <coughs> A lot of people live in the now. Everything, it, things that we do each week ought to have etern, ought to be eternal things. Things, eternal things, not the now things, but eternal things. Don't worry about the now. Worry about the wonderful blessings of eternity. Jacob, even though he wasn't saved yet, thought about holy things. He wanted to be. It wouldn't. Esau, guess what Esau was going to get to be? What part was he going to play in his family if he was the head of the family? He was a patriarch. That means the high father. Patriarch. What was the high father? What, what, what place was he in the family? He was a priest of the family. He was the spiritual leader of the family. The high father, the spiritual leader of the family. Esau didn't care anything about that. But Jacob did. He wanted to be the kind of leader that his father was. He wanted to be the spiritual leader of that family. He wanted to be the patriarch of his family. He wanted to be the one whom the blessing of God went through. Because his father, his grandfather Abraham had been blessed. He said that through you I will bless all the nations of the world. Well, Esau got tricked out of his birthright. Well, here... 
Jacob is out here. He's coming back into the land. He's been gone for 20-something years. He's coming back in the land to this mad red-headed boy with a stunk like a goat. Hair all over him. He comes back into the land and he's afraid of this he-man. This hulk of a guy. And he knows what's going to happen. Because if God doesn't change Esau's life, what's, God, what's Esau going to do to Jacob? Kill him and take everything he's got. <coughs> because that's all he's sworn all of his life is killing his brother and taking, every, and taking that birthright back. I don't think he really... I mean, he willingly gave his birthright to Jacob, didn't he? What do you think he was going to do to Jacob to get the birthright back? If he's dead, it's mine again. All right? Right from the very beginning. He never planned on giving it to him. He was going to kill him. Well, Jacob's out there laying out there on the stars saying, God, please help me because I'm going back in here and I have this bad brother. This bad dude, he's going to kill me. And so he saw a vision. And he saw angels doing what? Going back and forth into an escalator. We're having the stairway into heaven. This is what we call Jacob's life. And right there that night is where many theologians believe that Jacob was saved. That's where he had his born again experience. Right there. Now right there underneath the tree, somewhere, sometime in Nathaniel's life, <coughs> guess what he had? <coughs> he came to grips with his eternal soul and he prayed to God and asked God to forgive him and he had this Jacob's Ladder experience. And all of us have our Jacob's Ladder experience, don't we? Is there a time in your life where you come to God and you say, Lord, forgive me? Do you remember what it was? Punctual your action. Harris tense, see? At the point in time. Because there is a time. If you are saved, there is a time in your life. I mean, you're not born saved, people. <coughs> there is a time in your life when you realize that you are a sinner. When you realize that that you your sin is separate has separated you from God, and you have an experience, you have a this stairway to heaven, this Jacob's ladder experience. But once you're born again, you're guranteed the resurrection. You're guaranteed forgiveness of sins, so brother. All the Jacob's trouble is that part of the tribulation? Oh yeah, the Jacob's trouble. Uh, the tribulation period is called Jacob's trouble because who is Jacob's children? Israel. Why is the tribulation period coming upon the earth? Bring to bring you. Israel back to God. All right, God, I'm not finished with this. All right, going back to Jacob's ladder. Now, when Christ came down to earth, I want you to understand something. When God, John 1 1, John 1 14, John 1 18, someone read John 1 18 for me. That's very important. That's all in, in this Jacob's ladder. One, John 1, 45 through 51. But John 1, 18 now. Who's that? Dr. John, you got that one? No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He was declared Him. All right. Someone else read that from another translation. The only begotten Son. What does it say there? Have you got that, Brother Greg? Yes. <clears throat> no one has ever seen God at any time the only unique Son, or the only begotten Son, who is in heaven, in the immediate presence of the Father, He has de declared Him, He has revealed Him, and brought Him out where He can be seen. He has interpreted Him, and He has made Him known. All right, so who's got New American Standard? I have. You got that, brother? Read that for us. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God. All right, that's what I want. The only the begotten God. Now go on from that point. The only begotten God, that's what it says in the original language. The only be begotten God who is in, in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him. Now the word explained Him there shouldn't be explained. What it says, it literally says, it comes from two Greek words. we got stuff all over this deal. Ek. And ago. That's the two Greek words that, that comes from. And ek, that's where the word exit comes from. Alright? What do you think that means right there? Ek. 
Lead out. out. Lead out. Okay, ago means I lead, I bring, I go. So what do you say? What do you think this means? Let himself out. And it's in the middle voice again. He has led himself out of space, out of eternity into space and time. That's what John the first child, 1 1, 1 1 14, 1 18 means. The only begotten God. He is God, not little God, I mean God. The God of heaven, the creator God. Colossians, the first chapter, tells you about that. All right? He has led himself out. Now, God, Christ, Christ, what's the word Christ mean? Christos. Jesus Christos. What? Anointed one. How about Jesus? Now, Spanish, that's the same in Greek and in Spanish. It's the same. Jesus Christus. All right. What is Jesus? What does that mean? Jesus. But it actually should mean Joshua. That's a bad translation. It should mean Joshua. That's the Hebrew word Joshua. What does Joshua mean? It means the one who the one Jehovah saves. That's what it means. Jehovah saves. Who's going to save anybody? Jehovah is the one who saves. All right. Jehovah saves because Jehovah has led himself out of heaven down into an earthly vessel, the human form, to dwell among his creation, to redeem his creation back to himself. And you know something? Now, I, I, this will probably just throw you for a loop because I don't, I don't think I ever heard it preached before. But that incarnation, when God became flesh, it is perpetual. It never will stop. Because God is related to his whole creation forever. And because he's related to his creation, he can redeem it back to himself. Just think about that for a little while. God in space and time one particular time, God became related to his creation. In Genesis, the first chapter, I told you before, God created man, he created him in his image, in his shadow casting likeness, his blood flowing, and his spiritual likeness. Everything about God, God created man in his likeness, <coughs> what he would become in the person of Jesus Christ. All right? That's what we call a pre Adamic Christ. There, the dealt. That's the one, the creator. According to Colossians, the first chapter. God created man not from dirt, but from the same elements that he created dirt, but, if, but man was to become dirt when he died. And when God came in the person of Jesus Christ, he was created to mankind, but he was related to every other physical, material creation of his all, all of his creation, but forever related to it. And forever redeemed. Just think about that for a while. Forever related to it, perpetually, and forever redeeming it. The creation. Jesus said, when he came, he said, if people did not cry out, he said, what would cry out? The rocks would cry out. It says that the creation itself groans for the redemption of mankind. When is that redemption of mankind going to take place? Huh? Remember when the bird flew away? What did that typify? The resurrection. After we're resurrected, and after the thousand year reign of Christ, when God creates a new heaven and a new earth forever, forever the creation will be safe from sin. The creation will be safe from sin because there will be no sin heaven and the new earth. All right. No sin in the new heaven and the new earth. Are you still enjoying this? Are you learn something from it? There's a lot of stuff in types of the Bible. That's why I spent, I'm going to spend several weeks teaching types to you. Do you have any questions? Come on, I'll open you up here. Somebody asked me a question at work. I didn't quite know how to answer it. They asked me that uh, I know we're going to be judged for our works and tried by fire. Mm -hmm. that, our works will be tried by yeah, fire. Is that, is that going to be after the thousand year millennium or for the time that we die and we're ushered into heaven? 
When we die, we go to heaven. If you're saved, you go to heaven. Yeah, I know that. If you're lost, you go to hell. Okay? But when you come before the judgment seat of Christ, that's at a different period of time. That's at the end of the tribulation period. Is that after a thousand years then? Yeah. No, no, before that. That's before that. Okay, that's before the thousand year reign of Christ. And then you're everything that you do, whether you did it for the Lord or whether you did it for yourself or whether you did it for prestige or whatever you did, it's going to come out plainly at that period of time. Jesus says, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Remember that? What in the world is that talking about? That's weird, isn't it? I've, lo I've looked at that all of my life. The last shall be first and the first shall be last. Who's going to receive the greater judgment in this world? The ones who know more. The ones who know more. You know, the teachers and the pastors. Those are the ones. We are the ones that are going to be judged greatly. Because what do we have to live by today? What do we have to live by? God's Word. God's Word. And who who sheds forth God's Word in the world today? The pastors and the teachers by the guidance of the Holy Spirit. But pastors and teachers, Brother, Brother Joe. Oh, I just, there was a, something I thought that came by. I thought that uh, when the Lord came down and, and John the Baptist, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, and then a dove coming down with him out of heaven uh -huh. on the shoulder, typifying that dove coming back. Here I see. And then also when the, <coughs> they took the spear and they struck that spear in the Lord's side of the cross. Uh -huh. Blood and water. Out ran. came blood and water. You know, so another... Do you see all of the types carried in that? Yeah. Do you see all of that just coming together? Types are very important. There are a lot of people today that will not study types. They're, I mean, uh, they don't believe in it. Why? It's not, not going to mean nothing. Well, I'm going to tell you something. The Bible, we, we went through, when we started this class last week, we went through the different places. How many times did it talk about types in the New Testament in the Word of God? Types are a valid teaching. Now, for a type to be a real type, it has to be ordained of God. It has to be specified. Jacob's ladder is an absolute type. How many of you have ever tied in Nathaniel with Jacob's ladder before? Hmm? Yeah. That's very important. That's what happened there. There was that we have Jacob's ladder. That's what he was seeing. And Jacob's ladder was a type of Christ coming to the earth. And the angels coming back and forth. And that's what Jesus referred to there. That's what he referred to. Any other questions? Any, anything we have here? I'm going to give you a few moments and then we're going to have to dismiss and let the other class come in here. Any other any other questions? Come on, Brother Bill. Now you're always wanting to ask your questions. Also, when the leper came to the Lord in John, and uh, he felt compassion for him, and the Lord healed him mm -hmm. right away, right there. Yeah. That's another type of the Old Testament. Come to the New Testament. In other words, the Old Testament being the teacher and the master of the New Testament yeah. from the life. The Old Testament teaches us about Christ. The Old Testament is a shadow of things to come. Amen. Let me show you this just a little bit. Now this was a backwards teaching. It's kind of backwards. does things a little bit backwards here. In the Old Testament, we have the sun shining here. Alright, this is sun. Sun beams going down. And the cross is here in space and time. John 1, 14. Okay? Jehovah became flesh. He became flesh to do one thing. To be type of that dove in the Old Testament. The sun shining over here and, and this cross is casting a shadow where? In the Old Testament. This is New Testament times over here, okay? But here we have a shadow cast into the Old Testament. And the shadow is here. The real thing was yet to come. But the shadow was back here. And the writer of the book of Hebrews says that the Old Testament were shadows of things to come. 
And he said it was very important because there had to be a real thing to cast a shadow. So the cross was real, wasn't it? And the sun shining on the cross, casting the shadow in the Old Testament, the Old Testament offering, the Old Testament sacrifices, the Old Testament festivities and holidays, even the Sabbath, all of these things were what? A type of him who was to become John 1, 14. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that a beautiful thing? What a beautiful, beautiful story for us to see. What a beautiful story. Well, these are all we're going to study about some other things, too. We're going to study about Melchizedek. All right? And we're going to study about the feast. And one thing that we're going to study about very importantly is the tabernacle. And Brother Joel has got a book on the tabernacle. And we're, if, if you can, bring that, Brother Joel. We'll pass that around. We're, we're probably going to teach two or three weeks on the tabernacle. Because I'm going to, I've taught little things about the tabernacle before. I'll give you a shot of things. But we're going to go and study even numbers. How many of this was there and whatever. And we're going to see some real revelation from that. And all of that is what? Shadow. A type or a shadow of him that would become. Beautiful then. Absolutely beautiful, beautiful story. And I hope that you can take some of this. This is something you can witness with too. How many of you knew this even existed before the last two weeks? How many of you knew it did? How many of you didn't know it? All right? Didn't know it even existed. Well, see, that's why you come to Sunday school. Tell you a little bit of the story. You know why Sunday school was started? Why was Sunday school started? You want to read? Maryland. You know, in, in early America, little children, when they were about five or six years old, in the South there was slavery, in the North there was slavery. That's all the world's ever known, there's a whole lot of slavery. Okay? In the South there was slavery on the plantations, in the North there was slavery in the, in the, in the mills, and things were, and little kids had to go to work when they were five years old and worked 10 and 12 hour 15 hour work days and they just worked into them and they had no way to ever get up out of that situation so Baptist churches back in those days they were going to where they demanded that these factories let the children off for Sunday and they would take them to Sunday school and they would teach them how to read and write mm. read and write so they could get out of that so they could get away from that type and, and get out of that line and of course they taught them how to read and write the Bible and the Bible story the Bible has been a, a, a textbook for hundreds thousands of years and we're still teaching the word of God and you know what it's still a lot there to, to learn even today thank you for your attention today God bless you and I'll turn this over to Brother Gray and, uh, and again you're invited to my house today Right after services today, out there on Gosford Road, 15313 Gosford Road. And uh, come and, and have hamburgers and salad and beans. I made a great big pot of beans this big with chili beans. I made them, Joe. All right. <laughs> All right. They're, they're homemade. We've got salsa to go with that and other things with it, so you're invited. And thank you for your attention. God bless you. Brother Greg. I have to put this stuff up. The announcements now.